Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to talk about toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is caused by an infection with the protozoal species known as Toxoplasma gondii. What I want you to take from this is it is a protozoal species that's causing the infection. And it is an obligate intracellular parasite. Here is a picture of that protozoal species. Now, Toxoplasma gondii has a worldwide distribution. Cats and livestock act as hosts for this protozoa. And mice act as intermediate hosts. Now, there are several different sources by which a person can be infected with this protozoa. One is through cat feces. So, in this source or in this transmission, the person gets exposed to the toxoplasma oocysts. The second source is through undercooked meat, and in that source, it is the tissue cysts. There's also horizontal transmission. This can include through organ transplant or a, a blood transfusion from an infected person. And the fourth source is vertical transmission from mother to child. And this leads to something known as congenital toxoplasmosis. We'll talk more about this in the next few slides. But what I want you to take from these sources is that the first three sources lead to what is known as acquired toxoplasmosis. And the fourth leads to congenital toxoplasmosis. And we're going to talk about the differences between acquired and congenital a little later on. So as we mentioned before, the hosts include cats and livestock. And humans can be infected from cats through fecal oocysts, and humans can be infected from livestock through undercooked meat ingesting tissue cysts. So again, the sources are cat feces with fecal oocysts and undercooked meat with tissue cysts. So when someone ingests either fecal oocysts and or tissue cysts, they transform into what is known as tachyzoites shortly after ingestion. These tachyzoites then enter the muscle and neural tissues of the individual and become a bradyzoite cyst. Now, what is most concerning is that in a pregnant woman who is exposed to cysts, these tachyzoites can pass through the placenta and infect the developing fetus, leading to what we call congenital toxoplasmosis. So what is the clinical presentation of toxoplasmosis? We're going to first talk about congenital toxoplasmosis. And congenital toxoplasmosis has a classic triad of three signs and symptoms. And we're going to use a mnemonic device C. H I or chi, like the energy force chi, or you can use HIC, H I C, as in hiccup, whichever helps you remember these three signs and symptoms. The first one is chorioretinitis, the second one is hydrocephalus, and the third one is intracranial calcifications. So the classic triad again is chorioretinitis, hydrocephalus, and intracranial calcifications. Congenital toxoplasmosis can also lead to microcephaly. And, and toxoplasma or toxoplasmosis is actually one of the torch infections that you might have learned about before. The T in torch is actually toxoplasmosis. And this is one of the infections that leads to an intrauterine growth restriction. Generally, during pregnancy, the, a woman will actually be infected with toxoplasma in the third trimester. However, it can happen at any trimester, and being infected in the first trimester leads to worse outcomes for the infant. And when we mean, or when we talk about infection during pregnancy, we actually mean primary infection. If a woman has actually been infected prior to pregnancy, they have already either clear the infection or have suppressed the infection and it is not a concern. It is more of a concern when this is the first time a woman has been infected with 
toxoplasma. So if the first time a woman is infected with toxoplasma is during their pregnancy with their child, that is when we get concerned. So the primary infection is actually what we worry about. Now, this is all in contrast to acquired toxoplasmosis. Acquired toxoplasmosis is generally asymptomatic. It can be latent, so it can basically be in a suppressed form and have no symptoms at all, but the person is still infected with toxoplasma. It can persist for the life of the person. And generally, immunosuppression can lead to reactivation. So when a person is severely immunosuppressed, as in AIDS, this can lead to a reactivation of toxoplasma, leading to toxoplasmosis. And it can lead to an acute systemic infection. We're going to talk about more about these symptoms of acquired toxoplasmosis in the next slide. With acquired toxoplasmosis, there are a wide variety of signs and symptoms that we can see with an individual that is infected with toxoplasma. One is, again, this acute systemic infection. This acute systemic infection generally occurs at 5 to 23 days after an infection. It can occur in immunocompetent individuals. Most of the time it's asymptomatic, but some individuals can have symptoms. Those who do develop symptoms have a benign and generally self-limited course that lasts for a few weeks to months. Cervical lymphadenopathy is the most common symptom in acquired toxoplasmosis. It is a bilateral and symmetrical non-tender lymphadenopathy of the neck. This usually happens within weeks of infection. A subset of individuals, about 20 to 30 percent, will have generalized lymphadenopathy. And there can also be constitutional symptoms such as fever, chills, and sweats, and this usually occurs for two to three days. Other symptoms of acquired toxoplasmosis can include headaches, myalgias, pharyngitis, hepatosplenomegaly, so an enlargement of the liver and spleen. And in rare cases, toxoplasmosis can lead to pneumonitis, myocarditis, and pericarditis. So myocarditis is the inflammation of the cardiac muscle, and pericarditis is an inflammation of the pericardium that surrounds the heart. It can also lead to polymyositis, hepatitis, encephalitis, or a posterior uveitis. And having said all of this, again, majority of immunocompetent individuals are asymptomatic for toxoplasmosis. But in some individuals, we can see some of these symptoms and especially in those with a reactivation due to immunosuppression. So how do we diagnose and what do we use to treat toxoplasmosis? For diagnosis, we use serology looking for antibodies to toxoplasma gondii. With CSF, we can do a right GM sustain, and we can use PCR to look for genetic evidence of toxoplasma gondii. In immune-compromised patients, these are the patients we worry about the most for either symptomatic toxoplasmosis or a reactivation of toxoplasmosis. We can do a head CT scan, and we can do ophthalmological examinations. And how do we treat it? What do we use to treat toxoplasmosis? Again, because oftentimes this is a benign, self-limited infection, and a lot of times individuals are asymptomatic, we often do not require a treatment for toxoplasmosis. However, there are special considerations. During pregnancy, we would like to use spiramycin or pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine. For HIV patients, we can also use pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine as well. And for eye disease related to toxoplasmosis, 
we can use corticosteroids. So anyways, guys, I hope you found this lesson helpful. That was a lesson on toxoplasmosis and looking at the differences between acquired and congenital toxoplasmosis. I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.